Jay, thank you so much for coming. That's Stephen A in the house, Max Kellerman, Molly Carroll. What's up? How are you doing? What's going on? Why are you so fired let's up? Go, go, let's go. Is oh, it, let's go. I don't know. Oh, it's it's Wednesday it. Eve, or does that make it worse? Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no I'll take Wednesday Eve. No. And about Wednesday Eve. It's about a whole down bunch down. of chirping that was going oh. on in the nation's capital over the last few months. I'm naming Thanks names. To no one. I'm naming names. Let's go. He's Let's go. How y'all doing? Else. Let's go. Monday Night Football has not been kind to our nation's capital. Just ask one Stephen A. Smith. The Redskins are 1 in 16. Listen to that. 1 in 16 at home on Monday Night Football since 1998. Falling to a Panthers team that is last in the NFC South. Last year's NFC's champs are now 7 6 and 1, third in the NFC East, and fell from the sixth spot to the eighth spot in the NFC. Mr. Smith. Do I have your undivided attention? Oh, yeah. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Ask the question. What's Ask the question right here. What's happened to the Redskins? Oh, they flopped. They, 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 I, I'm sorry. Let me, let me, let me. How, how would you like me to do this, Max Kellerman? Do you want me to say the, they flopped? You want me to go like this? You want me to go like this? That's what y'all want me to do? Don't get in trouble. I don't know. I just remember they I were know, talking I, a I lot. I didn't get no slash mark or whatever. I, I said choke. I ain't getting no trouble for choking. You choke. I didn't choke. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not wishing ill will upon you. I believed in the Redskins. Mm. Am I not? Am I lying? Did I not believe in them? Did I not talk about Deshaun Jackson? Did I not talk about Pierre Garçon? Did I not talk about Jordan Reed? Did I not talk? Did I not talk about all of these dudes? Did I not talk? Did I not talk about Matt Jones? Did I not warn that dude to not, not run his mouth before they played against the Cowboys because they ain't had a running game since? Did I not warn him about that? Did I not talk about Kirk Cousins and how I applauded this man? Believing in himself, betting on himself, approaching his final year of contract, taking a franchise tag for $19.95 million. Was that not me? Was I not the one that was subjected to scrutiny by my friend Doc Walker? Uh -huh. His radio show in DC. That's my man. I love Doc Walker. Brian Mitchell, don't know him too well. Really good guy. Very, very knowledgeable about football. You know what I'm saying? We know what he did as a Redskin. No disrespect to him, no shade to him. But I would dare say that he was cruel to me. He was mm. not kind to me when I was a guest on 980 ESPN Radio in Washington, D.C., treating a guest like that. Why? Because I had the temerity. The, uh, because I had the temerity, the unmitigated gall to sit up there and say, excuse me, why are you walking around here calling yourself the champions of the NFC East and all of this other stuff when the Dallas Cowboys are in first place? That was me. That was me. If y'all don't believe me, if y'all don't recall what the video stated, could you show it, please? Take it away. We were the damn East, not really, not that, not all of them. We were the East. You better remember we got that damn title. Don't forget who the real champs of the NFC East is. Everybody looking on the track. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? This is not about numbers. This is not about the night that Cam Newton had. This is not about the night that, that the Redskins, you know, you know, statistically speaking, they didn't show up. You know, they were missing tackles. They were dropping passes. This was about the fact that this was a Monday night game. By the way, a Monday night game, I think they've lost 16 of their last 17 appearances on Monday night football. I would dare make the argument that the Redskins should be banned from Monday night football. I don't think they should be allowed. Why do you get to lose that much on national TV? We shouldn't be subjected to such an effort. The two, I would say that the NFL schedule makers should prohibit, forbid, ban the Washington Redskins from Monday Night Football until further notice because I think a legitimate argument could be made that they no longer belong on national television. Your offense couldn't get anything going. Your defense couldn't make stops when it needed to. You had Josh Norman out there, okay? You know that you acquired him. He's a $50 million man guaranteed, $75 million overall. You were looking for him to make some noise, but he needed help. And you had a whole bunch of dudes on the Redskins who are relative rough riders. We know they can play. I got respect for them. But we question, what did I say? Just like the Cowboys can be an accident waiting to happen. What do I say about the Redskins? They are allergic to prosperity. The second you expect anything from this team, they don't show up. Poor John Gruden there watching his little brother coach this team last night had being subjected to this nonsense on national television. But I'm not surprised because when you chirp and chirp and chirp, you know, these are the kind of things that happen. And, and by the way, I've gotten on the Dallas Cowboys mm. for not winning a Super Bowl since 1995. Really? Oh. The Redskins haven't won one since 1991. 1991. This team is 25 years and counting away from a Super Bowl. The team with the hogs. The team with, you know, I, I mean, Joe Gibbs is the coach. Joe Thighs.
Osmond was a Super Bowl. Mark Rippey had won a damn Super Bowl for crying out loud. Dougie Williams, the first black quarterback to do it. I mean, there's great history and tradition with these Washington Redskins. Does this team stand up to the challenge and respond? No. They fold like cheap tents. They folded. They choked. They didn't get it done. They brought it on themselves, and that's what I wanted to say. I, I have one more question for you. I want to follow up with this. Sure. What was the criticism? Look, when they came out and said, then I'll get to my point. When they came out and said, talking, we're the champs of the NFC. We run the NFC East. It's early in the season. You're not in first place. Who cares who wins the, like, you got to be kidding me. You get shellacked in the playoffs in your one playoff game last year, whooped up on uh, and, and at home, and uh, you're talking smack early in the next season. So you were critical of them. You said they were cruel to you when you well, went well, on well, well, I, 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 How I, were they cruel? I, what did they say? I must say, you know, I, 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 allow me to, to, to regurgitate that. Doc Walker is the voice of the rest because that's my brother. I love him. I'm just playing around with him. That's my man, you know, okay? But my man Brian Mitchell, I don't know him that well, but cool, brother. He go on the radio show and... I'm like, yo, man, could you let me talk? I ain't gonna ask you to be on the damn show. I don't care whether you're on the show or not. I was like, it, treating a guest this way. They, he was so disrespectful to me. He was, it what was, was their, their argument, though? Their, their argument was, why are you gonna get on the Redskins like that? Because they're not I that mean, good. Because, you know, you would just speculate. You just guess, guessing about what? That I saw him walking into the locker room talking smack so I had a comment about it? It wasn't like I did some insider report and reported some false information or something like that. All I did was say, what the hell are you worried about? Today the is the day. Look, look, even if you were guessing, even if you were guessing, your guess turned out to be right. To answer your question directly, it seemed to be a bit personal to me. It seemed like Brian Mitchell felt like I was talking about him, like he's still playing for the Redskins. No, when he was playing for the Redskins, they were actually winning games. They were actually winning games. Not the case right now. Yeah, well, so I mean, they like, went. What's, what's up? They went like up? half their games. They're, they're, listen, here's the thing about Washington, and they took it personally, <clears throat> which means they're also thin-skinned on top of being mediocre. They are, as Richard Sherman once said about Crabtree, which wasn't, it hasn't turned out to be true, but yeah. it is true about Washington, mediocre. Your franchise, actually a terrible owner, actually a subpar franchise, but the team, your, this iteration of the franchise, this team is mediocre. Mm -hmm. You're an eight and eight type team. And for them to pretend that they're otherwise and to be critical of you or anyone, which also shows they're thin skinned, is ridiculous, and today is the day for those who predicted that they're mediocre or that it's no, you shouldn't be bragging early in the season about running the NFC East when you're not even in first place at that point. That's the day that those people get to gloat, and you have to shut up. Now, here's the problem with Washington. Go ahead. This is what I took from I the I thought game. you just said the problem very eloquently, I might add, but continue. Thank you very much. But continue. The problem is this. The playoffs are on the line. You are at home on Monday Night Football favored against a team with, though they're not mathematically eliminated in Carolina, nothing to play for. That team looked like it quit on this season long ago. You're favored to win, and they come into your house on Monday night football. And, if, and this is the most troubling thing if you're a Washington fan. On both sides of the ball, in terms of the running game, they were dominated. Now, why is that significant? Dr. Stewart, yes. Because at this point of the season, Mm -hmm. What that comes down to is the point of attack on the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And what that comes down to is who's ready to play. So the bottom line is the Washington franchise rolled over and said, scratch my belly. With the playoffs on the line, at the point of attack on the line of scrimmage, they got punked both sides of the ball, right. that is a mediocre team that is not ready for prime time. Well, you can say they're a mediocre team. They don't have mediocre talent to me. I think Jordan Reed is a stud. He was stupid last night for getting himself kicked out of the game. That just wasn't smart. First of all, what the hell are you doing punching somebody with a helmet on? They got a helmet on and you're using your fist to punch them. That's just dumb, okay? I'm sorry, he's not, I'm not calling him dumb. I'm calling his actions dumb, stupid, idiotic, and worthy of being uh, ejected from the game just for stupidity alone. What the hell are you? First of all, you're fragile enough, you're always injured, and then you're gonna sit up there with your hand and punch somebody's helmet? That's just stupid, that's number one. Number two, now see, I told you I'm naming names here. This dude, Robert Kelly, Remember him? Oh, you're the back dude on that, him? The, the, the dude, hold on, wait a minute. This is the dude that talked about the cow. What do you call the Cowboys? The Cowgirls? Cowgirls. Right. Before he played the Cowboys. So they happened to lose that game. That game, he rushes for 37 yards. 37 yards. 
Do you know this man hasn't had more than 63 yards rushing in the game since? And oh, by the way, last night, nine carries, eight yards. So you chirped and opened your mouth, and sure enough, you ain't getting it done. And so I look at stuff like that. I'm not going to get on my man Chris Baker because he's got a mouth, but he backs it up. He can play the whole bit. Collectively speaking, they got to get something together. I don't know if Jay Gruden is the answer, but at the same time, I can't put last night on him. They're professionals. They get paid. You, If there was something schematically wrong and guys were wide open and y'all seem to be a bit discombobulated, that I will point the finger at. But in terms of effort, in terms of making tackles, in terms of making catches, I can't put that on Jay Gruden. I got to look at this team. And, 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 and no, 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 please don't get me wrong. Doc Walker, I'm playing around because I got, I got nothing but love for them. But Doc Walker knows this football. Brian Mitchell knows this football. I will lean on them to give me the expertise on the nuances that may have transpired you think yesterday. You get a call today? Well, I don't, I, 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 Every year, though? Every year you need the nuances, they never win. Well, I'm just saying, but they call it out. I'm saying they call it like they see it. So I'm good with that. Right. I'm just simply saying, with this Redskins team, you got Josh Norman, you got Breland, you got, I mean, you got Kerrigan in the crew, you got Bacon in the crew. On offense, Garcon, Deshaun Jackson, Crowder's big time. I mean, and, and sounds, then you get, I mean, come Stephen on, a, that, that, you got all the weapons. They don't, have the, they don't have the guys up front on defense. To me, they That's have, right. they are an averagely talented team on offense They're over a average, team on defense wise. under average, maybe barely. Let me tell you something. Forget about the fact that they have an arrogant and unapologetic owner who should change the name of that team years ago, and it's doubling down. It's well, stupid I'm and arrogant. I'm glad you brought it up Number because one. that's where your heart lies. Well, okay, fine. Oh, Number two, fair. I'm also a Giants fan. Let me tell Washington, and I lived in D.C. for 15 months. At least I had an apartment down there when I was hosting originally Around the Horn in 0203. Yes. I know what kind of football town that is. It's an insane football town. There is no town in the United States of America that cares more about their team than Washington cares about their team. I acknowledge that, guys. But let me just tell you what it's like to be a Giants fan, a fan of a t another team in the NFC East. I see the Cowboys on the schedule. I'm like, ooh, I want to get them. That's going to be a tough game. I see the Eagles on the schedule, even when the Eagles aren't good. Like, I'm worried about this week's game with the Eagles because they always play the Giants tough. The one team, and it doesn't mean that the Giants always win this game, where the other NFC East teams go, oh, good, we got them on the schedule, is Washington. The rest of the division loves to see you on the schedule because everyone else we view as a tougher situation than Washington. They are the ones, even when they won the division last year, mm -hmm. even when they had RG3, and I was like, uh-oh, he's a problem. I was still happier to see them on the schedule coming up than the Cowboys or the Eagles. The difference between those old teams and this one is this one has more mouth. They talk a lot. Yeah. And they fail to back it up. Well, they won't win Period. it again this year. We They're haven't a had a repeat team. champ in They're the NFC team. East in 12 years. You know what time it is, folks? Time to keep up with the Joneses. Jerry truly is the gift that keeps on giving during this holiday season. Now, listen to this. You can't make it up. In a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal, Jones admits to intentionally fueling the quarterback controversy in Dallas because it creates storylines and drama. That's one of the things that makes sports interesting. I do feed that. Max, if you're Dak Prescott, what should you think about this? Well, first of all, I don't know if I'd believe Jerry Jones. <clears throat> it's human nature. Look, sometimes we have this, like, a piece of behavior in our own life. And after the fact, we try to figure out why we did something. And so we map on these reasons in retrospect. Well, I did this because of that, as though it followed this very logical cause and effect pattern and we had it planned out when in reality, if you really think about it, no, we didn't, we, we don't know. There are reasons we did it, but it, weren't, it wasn't those reasons. It's just now it makes sense that we said that. And I think he's embarrassed by the fact that he caused this controversy. And now I think Jerry Jones is making this up, at least maybe not intentionally lying or anything, just mapping on reasons that would make sense now, given what's happened. Happened, whether that's conscious or unconscious. That's the first thing I would think if I were Dak Prescott. The next thing I would think is if this dude is telling the truth and that's the way he intends or that's the kind of leadership he wants to show for this franchise as the owner who also likes to be called coach and is the self-appointed GM, although we know his son now, thankfully for the Cowboys fans, has much more influence on personnel um, decisions, then I would say what kind of way is that to lead? If, if we are to take Jerry Jones at his word, why should leadership be rooted in sowing dissension and falsehoods, right? Why isn't it rooted in integrity and truthfulness? Like if you look at the way Greg Popovich leads the Spurs, he doesn't need to rely on dishonesty as the root of the leadership in order to stir things up. What kind of leadership is that? So I would say 
I don't think he really knows why he said it in fact. So I would say that the first explanation, I don't even take at face value, but if you are to take it at face value, it's even worse for Jerry Jones because then he's just a bad leader. Well, listen, you sound like Dear Abby right now. Let me be very, very clear about that. And I understand where you're coming from, but damn, the bottom line is it's far more simpler than you explained. Jerry Jones was trying to sabotage Dak Prescott. He wants Tony Romo up in there. Now my man Michael Irvin, Mr. Pom Pom himself, because I thought that he had a lot more objectivity about the Dallas Cowboys in years past he always has. But this year, he seems to be caught up in the sauce, and as a result of that, he's got his pom-poms on, which is understandable because that's who he was a Hall of Famer for, the Dallas Cowboys. But it's still sickening to hear the playmaker, you know, you know, just bloviate about them. Having said all of that, he tried to make the point, Jerry Jones is just playing, just playing games here because he's trying to elevate Tony Romo's value around the league to give the impression that he's far, far more valuable than people realize so he could get something in exchange if for Tony Romo. If that was the case, Listen, that would make sense to me. Let me tell you why it doesn't make sense. Because him talking about Tony Romo doesn't speak louder than Tony Romo's resume. He's 78 and 49 as a starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys in his NFL career. That would speak volumes to Tony Romo. Not, Terry, not Jerry Jones pontificating the bottom. We don't need to hear Jerry Jones on that. Jerry Jones knows this. Jerry Jones was trying trying to sabotage Dak Prescott. Jerry Jones, I'm not saying he wanted the kid hurt. He knows the kid is his future. And not only that, Jerry Jones, I'm not being as insidious as that to say that he would wish some physical harm to a person. I would never be that irresponsible. What I am saying is if there was a way in Jerry Jones' mind, if there were a way for him to win that coveted and evasive Super Bowl with Tony Romo as his quarterback instead of Dak Prescott, he'd take it any day of the week and twice on Sundays. That's who we're listening to when we're listening to Jerry Jones. Jerry Jones wants Tony Romo to be that quarterback. He does not want this team to win the Super Bowl without Tony Romo on the, si on the, on the field. He doesn't want Tony Romo on the sidelines. Are you Super saying he would rather not win the Super Bowl no. than win it with No, him? no. So I'm his first saying, priority is win the his Super first Bowl. Priority is win then it's win with Romo. There you go. That's exactly well, see, what I'm saying. The problem saying. is when That's you take exactly your, what I'm saying. I think, your eye I off think the it's a win like with that, Romo, and then the I Super think Bowl. it's win the Super no, Bowl. No, 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 no. It's not win. No, no. He doesn't want to sacrifice a Super Bowl championship for Romo. But if but he he'll could wind have, up doing but so. if he could have, that's right. He, he can't get out of his own way. But if he could, if he could have the Super Bowl. And Romo, that would be ideal. Most owners are like this. Give it to me any way I can get it. Yeah. I can give a damn. No. Jerry wants Romo So to you believe be that, him, that he truly feels this way, that That's he's right. intentionally That's right. feeling Absolutely. this way. Absolutely. Reason he's lying, and I'm going to say he's lying. He wants Tony Romo up in there. This is not a game to him. Every day that Dak Prescott goes out there and performs lights out, it is a thorn in Jerry Jones' side to some degree because he loves it, but it's, it, it's Here's the bittersweet problem with Jones. because he wants Romo in there. Here's the problem with Jerry Period. Jones. He's not that good. You, he's not good enough to get away with that to try to win in a certain way. Let me tell you, the greatest owner in the history of American team sports by far, and I love Steinbrenner, I'm a Yankees fan, but it's clearly the late, great Dr. Jerry Buss. That guy won 10 championships in like 30 years and was in like five others. Um, and he was able to not only win and really overtake the Celtics as the dynasty in that sport, but do it in a certain way. He actually said, I need this to be entertainment. I need it to be showtime. Almost anyone else who ever lived can't do both. You can't become the great championship dynasty and do it with a certain brand that you want to promote. That's impossible. Only Je Dr. Jerry Buss has been able to do it. Uh, Jerry Jones ain't Jerry Buss. He's not a pale imitation of Jerry Buss. He can't win the Super Bowl since he was able to manipulate the salary cap by ushering in the era of the salary cap, followed by manipulating the rules by inventing, because he is a brilliant businessman, obviously, uh, inventing the prorated bonus structure, getting around the cap. Since he manipulated that, he hasn't won a single Super Bowl under rules that treat other, you know, all the teams evenly and fairly, hasn't been able to do it. So he's not even good enough as an owner to win a Super Bowl under the current structure, but again, let alone to but, try but, to do it a certain way. I don't know how but the again, locker room feels but, about this. Listen. We don't know. They're not going to admit anything because they're winning. Mm -hmm. And why upset the apple cart? But don't, if you're Dak Prescott, 
Why say anything or feel anything? Because there's nothing you can do about what he feels, but you can do everything about what he does by going out there and performing because you've got Cowboys Nation behind you. Plus, you've got that offensive line and Ezekiel Elliott to buffer you to the point where even Des Bryant is sitting up there going like this because you understand the train that y'all are rolling on right now. But make no mistake about it. This is not a ploy. Jerry Jones wants Tony Romo in there. Jerry Jones is smart enough not to do harm to his meal ticket for the future. But if Jerry Jones had his way, Tony Romo would be the quarterback. Just the other day, there was some event going on. I don't know whether it was high school or oh, college. He was at the game. And, and who was sitting court. next to him? Who was sitting next to him? Tony it was Romo, Romo his adopted Jones, yeah. son. They hang together. They eat dinner together. They socialize. They're on the phone together. So Let me though. tell you something right now. Yeah, Let me tell you something right, right, right now. Tony Romo loves this man, and this man loves Tony Romo like a son. It's nothing negative against Dak Prescott, but this man wants Romo in in the worst way. Will he one day love Dak Prescott like a son? N I, listen, I don't think you'll love. That might be think, once in a this, lifetime. This, this this so many, is a He's just, you know, he's got love for the I playmaker. Think that could be listen, what you say? He's got love for the playmaker. Cool. You might have some love for prime time. Little love for Emmitt Smith and all of those guys. But there's there's something special about particular like relationships. Right yeah, yeah. Well, but there's there's something special about particular relationships. I'm not saying he's not going to love Dak Prescott, but Dak Prescott will never be Tony Romo. Listen, they can be clear. They can especially relish, be clear. especially if he wins a Super Bowl, he'll never go. be Tony Romo. There you they go. can relish in the fact they've made a lot of money together. Probably not win a chip. Coming up next, Christian McCaffrey has been highly criticized since he's decided to sit out of his final call game in order to prep for the NFL draft. Should he be catching so much flack? Plus, Cam Newton looking like his old MVP self last night, but one play's got him twisted. Listen up. First take is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. How does he handle the big moment? You have to take everything into consideration. Why? For what? Come on, dude. He sued everybody. Everybody. Now we have to watch what's actually happening. USA. I'm good. The countdown continues. We're just about two weeks away from First Take's big move to ESPN. Make sure you join us as we go from 2 to 1 on January 3rd. We're going to have some great special guests. Looking forward to it in our first week. We've got Ice Cube, Hall of Famer Jim Kelly, and a live performance by Wale. Meanwhile, there is an ongoing debate as to whether top players entering the NFL draft should forego their bowl games. There's no confusion for Stanford running back Christian McCaffrey, who will sit out the Sun Bowl to focus on his draft preparation, announcing that Monday on Twitter. Leonard Fournette will also pass on LSU's bowl game against Louisville to focus on the NFL draft. Here's some Twitter reaction from some gentlemen I'd say are very qualified to speak on this subject. Ezekiel Elliott, you might have heard of him. He wrote, all these young guys deciding to skip their bowl games. I would do anything to play one more time with my brothers in that scarlet and gray. Derek Carr responding to a Kirk Herbstreet tweet on this subject. I played my bowl game with a jacked up shoulder, wanted to play one more time with my boys. Not even a thought not to play. Well, Kane, in the house, how we doing? Good. Thank you, Molly. Good Max? to see you. Stephen A. Oh, What's up, man? How you doing? Max, I want to start yeah. with you on this. Do you have any problem with the player sitting out? Not at all. I mean, say it out loud. Uh, McCaffrey or whoever else. You should, in this case, you should risk your professional future, your financial future, and in the case of many of these players, a financial future that could secure the financial security of their family for generations to come. You should do it because you got to play in the Sun Bowl. <laughs> Look, the NFL and the NCAA in football work as a de facto syndicate mm -hmm. together and essentially coerce football players in this country. If you want to play on the highest level professionally in the United States of America, in the world, in football, you have to go through their college system. There is no minor league and you will not be paid and you will be asked to sacrifice or risk the few, your professional and financial future you know, in service of this. It never made sense to me why a player whose team had got no shot at the national championship anymore, their feet are held to the fire because they've made a commitment to their teammates and to the school when that commitment was made uh, in, a, in a world where they really didn't have much of a choice in the first place. And even if they did, 
I would strongly advise against playing in meaningless games, even meaningful games, if they feel that affects or, or risks their future. I got no problem with McCaffrey or anyone else sitting out. Yeah, I think Max is wrong. Um, and I started out where you are, to be honest. This was my initial gut reaction, but through the wonderful persuasion of my wife, and, no, and, and to no small extent, Danny Cannell, who I think's done a good job on this network voicing this opinion, I have realized the error of your position. The error in your logic is more easy to see. Here's the problem with your analysis, Max. Um, you have chosen the expedient path. There is principle and there is expediency. And often, expediency looks wise. Often it's rational. And that's why I started out where you are. Of course the analysis is exactly where you are. Of course the financial decision is easy to see for McCaffrey or Fournette or many of these guys. Doing the right thing for himself is a clear path. But I would ask you this. Is there any value to college football for the player beyond winning a national championship, beyond prefer preparing for the pros? Is there any value beyond those two goals? Is that a rhetorical question? No, I'm serious. The answer is yes, if they would have chosen college anyway, but in fact, they really don't have a choice. So if I am a college player and I decide I have no choice, I'm essentially coerced into this, this free minor league system for the, for the NFL, under those pre, uh, 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 restrictions, under those pretenses, then I would say, no, they have no obligation because it was a well, coerced decision in the first place. So this is the flaw in your logic. I agree, by the way, that college is a, is a coerced path to the NFL. I agree that is unjust, but you're focused on only one relationship in this equation, and that's the relationship the player has with the institution or with the coach who often leaves his program before it's time. But there's another relationship in the question, and this is the one about principle. This is the fact I recognize the easy, the, maybe even the wise path is to go to the NFL, but the principled path is to honor the commitment to your teammates. You have committed, whether or not you, you, you're right that this commitment was somewhat limited, you are committed to these teammates to see this through. And there's value in college football in being a part of a team, of being in something with other men. And when you opt out of it, you have chosen the expedient path at the cost of the principled path. Now, that can have many, many sacrifices internally, Max. That can have sacrifices externally when we talk about broad swaths. Maybe for Christian McCaffrey, he made the right choice for now for him. But make no mistake, he's made the your unprincipled argument, decision. Your argument is much yeah. cleaner if there wasn't coercion in the first place. If that was truly a free decision to play in college football, you have a clean argument. It's not, so you don't. I'm going to address what you said because here's where I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong when you talk about principal decisions and what have you, because let's keep in mind that these are collegiate athletes. There's no union. There's no representation for them. I mean, this is, this is big business, which is college football, and these dudes get exploited. And the universities are willing to look at you and say, well, you got a scholarship. Be happy, shut the hell up, and go out there and play. So we understand that there's an absence of representation. It's three years that you have to commit uh, to the university before you're allowed to go pro. You're using physicality as an excuse when clearly guys like Leonard Fournette was ready physically to be in the NFL at least a year ago, if not earlier than that. So let's take that into consideration. The other point, and the biggest point for me, when I think about this particular situation, what I don't like, and I was listening to Herm Edwards and Ryan Clark on Mike and Mike this morning talking about this, and I was actually upset that they didn't bring this up. Christian McCaffrey is an individual. He's white. He's at Stanford. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think he's been appreciated enough. Rushed for over 2,000 yards last year. Rushed for over 1,500 yards this year. Averaged more than six yards a carry. If he were black, he would have gotten more notoriety as a running back in college football for doing it. was almost like reverse discrimination. It really is true that that has happened to him. Having said that, here's where the problem lies. Jadavion Clowney, and please show highlights of this guy when he was playing at South Carolina. He took plays off. He took plays off. And he was eviscerated. People vilified him all over the place because he was trying to protect himself and guard himself from getting hurt. And the notion was, if you're going to be out there, go all out. When you start off the season, you're committing to finishing the season. With your teams, at 100%, you go all out. So whether you quit during plays, 
quit during games or not or elect not to show up to games. It all gets lumped into the same category. And the fact that Jadavion Clowney was vilified, but Christian McCaffrey, there's actually a debate as to him having not done anything wrong, Max, is where I disagree with you. Because my point is, is that if it was wrong for Clowney, then it was wrong, then it was wrong, wrong for McCaffrey. For well, I'm, just, I'm not saying you said it, but I'm saying the argument that people would make where they look at McCaffrey and they have no problem with it, but they had a problem with Clowney. That ain't right. So to be clear, you're saying now in response to Stephen A's argument, you wouldn't have a problem with Clowney taking plays off in order to protect his NFL career? You wouldn't have a problem with, right. with Clowney loafing That's in ridiculous. on the field? No, I, I think he shouldn't have been on the field if he didn't. Okay, but if he's on the field, what? Right. If, he's, uh, if he's on the field, I would say that in that situation, um, if you are favoring an injury because you don't want to aggravate That's it. not what I'm saying. Well, no, that's but that's, that's what essentially saying. what it comes down to. That's essentially what it comes down to. It's no, like, yeah, I, have to see. Uh, uh, I have to favor myself. I have to protect myself. We talk about this with athletes coming back from injury or battling fatigue, etc. If he feels that he's going to jeopardize the rest of his career, his professional career, Max, and position, financial security your position to play is a college than I football game, your position, I think that's absurd. Your position is worse than I thought because what you're saying is, is that even if he's healthy, but he wants to make sure that he can avoid a particular injury. He should go out there and give well, it half-ass. Hold, hold on, we talk about we talk about re, uh, athletes rehabilitating from injury. For example, now I'm talking De about on the field. Excuse me. Ex for example, Derek Rose. You can even see players who do check out as healthy, but are constantly doing the mental check with their body. Wait a minute, am I okay to cut like that? And simply don't do it the same way. And largely, that's psychological. What's the difference, Max? The problem with your argument, I think the clowny example has showed the absurdity of it is that once you commit to something, you have to see it through. You have to give it your yeah, it's all, Max. That's right. you can't, that the purpose the of college argument, football yeah. is not simply to make it to the pros. Yes, the it is. Of, it is not. not. Yeah, not for true. these guys, it is. It is not. Yeah, but, but that's a decision that the player gets to make for themselves. And the point is they've made that decision. That brings me to where when I joined started. The team. M McCaffrey no. joined this team. He now has a commitment to his teammates to see it through. Right. He has chosen, in your analysis, Max, he has chosen the self-interested path. It is right for his pocketbook. It is right wrong for the commitment that he made. You, I don't know why you're not with me on this if you're no, with no, me no, on the no. He's got to see because, it through. Because go the back to the, go back to the genesis of the, for. go back to the genesis of the commitment. If you really don't have a choice, you either commit or don't play football, that is not actually a commitment. That's a coerced commitment and 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 does and so if you at that point, yes, you are sacrificing the commitment you've made to the other players, which is unfair to them for your own self-interest and you have an argument that it is an immoral or unethical thing to do to those players. Look, but the fact that you entered into a coerced relationship in the first place I, undermines that. I don't that disagree that the system though. is flawed, that the system is very it's unethical, but it doesn't mean that individual actors within the system are therefore allowed to be immoral as well. You can be moral in an immoral system. Mm -hmm. You can do it. I yeah, agree and with that. Possible, I agree with that. And McCaffrey and that can, be, hold on, and can live up to, yes, and yes. it can be foolish, Max, right. but you still do what's right. Sometimes doing what what's right is bad for you, but you still Expedient, do it. You know why, Max? Expedience and right. foolish are two different things. And in fact, I yes. think it's wrong to do to the player in the first place. Therefore, the entire idea of the integrity of the system is undermined before they make the quote unquote. But, 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 but my point to you, Max, is this: Okay, then if you're McCaffrey, to use him as this example, yes. then sit out before the season. Yes. But once you commit to the season, you commit to the Guys, season. If you're you, just, hold on, you you spoke. You're sitting up there and acting as if. It is perfectly okay, and I'm not saying McCaffrey did this, let's be clear. But you're literally using Javion Clowney as an example. You're literally saying it's okay to commit to playing the season, going into the game, and giving a half-assed effort because you're monitoring your health for the future instead Correct. of going all out. What I'm saying is, then why play? I am why saying, not sit down? You guys are accusing, Especially when you had the cachet you guys, going into the season you when you would have went to the NFL. You guys are accusing me of making a moral relativistic argument. Yes, that is correct. I am. Yes. I'm making a morally relativistic argument because pragmatically in the real world, I think this does apply. And while you're right about be, about honoring commitments, even in a coerced situation, it is unethical toward the other players. I think that pragmatically speaking, the the not the expediency, but the wisdom of protecting yourself 
overrides it in this case, particularly because they are not playing for a national championship game. And if you want to be doctrinaire about morality, then you can argue, if you want to be hard about it, then you can argue that you can't make a morally relativistic argument. It doesn't matter what you're playing for. They are playing in the Sun Bowl. And does that change it? Look, yes, it does. You're right. It's pragmatic. You're right, it could be wise, but the point of principles is to do what's right when it's hard. The point of principles is to do what's right when it's against your own interest. I, Otherwise, I agree with, no, I just don't you do agree principles. With you can do it. I agree with it Will on that one. It is important to do what's right when it is inconvenient, I agree, but not when it is foolish, and I think it would be foolish in this case. Well, then why is it, if it's so foolish, then why play at all? He has no choice. No, 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 no. He came off, hold on. He came off a 2,000-yard season. Right. Christian McCaffrey could have sat out and still his value would have been there. Clowney mm. could have shot out, could have sat out, and still his value would have, one could argue, still his value would have been there. You didn't have to. You didn't have to. Yes, if you're going to be up in there, you're going to be rigged to try to make these guys play. And... I think it's okay to say, we as, has your point, as the season unfolds and you have a view of what's going to happen, if you are in the Sun Bowl, it's not the same thing as playing for a national title. Okay. we got to get a break in, but the great debate. And, I and can't both believe of you Steve and I are on the same really side. Strong, it's an uncomfortable Really strong argument. And I have a feeling our I audience feel like will be I take a shot. divided Oof. on this. <laughs> you too. Take you guys are unbelievable. We'll stay in with us when we come back. The Broncos got dominated by the Patriots this Sunday, so much so that a fight broke out in the locker room after the game. Are the Broncos on the decline? Plus... Cam was flagged after this play for unsportsmanlike conduct. So the guys like how he handled it after the game. We get into all of it. That's next. Check it out on the go. One day after Broncos left tackle, Russell Okun and cornerback Akib Talib got into a shouting match following the 16-3 loss to the Patriots. Gary Kubiak said there's no division between the offense and the defense. The Super Bowl champions are sitting in ninth place in the AFC standings and need a lot of help in order to get into the playoffs. Stephen A., is the Broncos' future in jeopardy? Um, I believe it is. And the reason why I believe it is is because of two reasons. Number one, uh, they don't have a definitive quarterback of the future. And number two, I don't believe in Kubiak. Um, I'm an individual that I will sit back and respect the fact that he deserves credit for not messing up a good thing. But I'm big on the process. What leads towards you getting that opportunity? And to me, he got the opportunity because of nepotism. He got the opportunity because of his relationship with John Elway. He did not get the opportunity because he was the best coach out there and was deserving of the opportunity in Denver based on the job that he did in Houston. He did not deserve it. So you end up with the job anyway, and oh, lo and behold, I, I have Peyton Manning, and I have uh, 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 Demarius Thomas, and I have Emmanuel Sanders, and I have Malik Jackson, I have Danny Trevathan, and I have the I just got a crew, keep to leave Chris Harris Jr. I got a TJ Ward. I got the whole crew available to me. So I just got to go up in there and not mess it up. How did he not mess it up? By not getting in Peyton Manning's way when Peyton Manning didn't want to listen to him. So Peyton Manning decided, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Even though my physical abilities have diminished drastically, I still have this. I know how to control both lines of scrimmage. I know how to manage a game to make sure that I don't allow the offense to beat ourselves. And that way the defense can take us to the promised land. Okay? So we're not listening to Kubiak. We're going to do things this way. And I think that now that he's gone... And you've had to listen more to Kubiak. It's not that he can't coach. I'm not saying he's some scrub coach that never deserves an opportunity to be a head coach. I'm saying that that team, as constructed, the way, the, what quality of a team was handed to him, he did nothing to deserve that other than the, uh, being friends with John Elway and a former teammate. That's what happened, John, and now it's coming home to roost. John Elway deserves the benefit of the doubt. The Bron what non-playoff team would you rather be a fan of than the Denver Broncos right now? The Denver Broncos are missing the biggest thing there is, which is a quarterback, if Paxton Lynch isn't the guy, right? But that is all they're missing. You look at the foundational pieces on that team, and look what John Elway did three, year, three seasons ago. Got to a Super Bowl on offense, no defense. Misses the play, doesn't get back the next year. Gets back to the Super Bowl and wins with one of the greatest defenses of all time. The more you look into that defense, the more you realize it's comparable with the greatest defenses ever. And they beat a one-loss team to win that Super Bowl. And then, because he didn't want to be mired in cap problems, he let a mediocre or worse quarterback walk out the door, tried to make do with what he had because he values the franchise over this particular iteration of the team. And when you look at the Broncos now, they are missing a quarterback. That, that's the big thing to get, but that's all it is. 
and 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 John Elway will find it, and when he does, they'll be right back in the big dance. That is not all they're missing, and the cult of John Elway has grown to Kool-Aid level proportions. It's gone into myth-making areas. Delicious, you here. should try some. By the way, to answer your question directly, Molly, the future of the Denver Broncos is in jeopardy. Jeopardy meaning your future is at risk of being in harm or danger. The immediate future is clearly in jeopardy. I don't think they're making the playoffs. I don't Neither know if do you I. Think. I do not. They're finishing with the Chiefs and the Raiders. The Dolphins on have the road, Bills on, on the schedule. road against the Chiefs. So they're going to miss the playoffs. They're out this year, in our estimation. We could be wrong, but that's our estimation now. And I think the long-term future is also in doubt. Max, it's not just the quarterback that is missing. By the way, clearly, the quarterback is missing. And let's not pretend like John Elway made this enlightened decision to pass on Brock Osweiler. He offered the guy $16 million a year. He drafted the guy ahead of Russell Wilson and Kirk Cousins. He tried to keep Brock Osweiler, and only when Houston came with the big money tree and shook it on Brock Osweiler's head, and Osweiler didn't give Elway a chance to match, did Elway look genius? At that point, he looks genius. This is when the myth starts building. Yes, they're missing a quarterback in the future, but you know what else they're missing? The other ingredient of long-term success. A running the, back? The offensive line. Well, cool. This is the 27th ranked offensive line by Pro Football Focus. Yeah. This is some of the worst offensive tackles in the NFL. The, Trevor Simeon is tied for third, or Broncos quarterbacks tied for third and getting sacked the most. Good luck. If, by the way, take one of the best quarterbacks in my estimation, Tony Romo. Put him on the Broncos. He's going to be on his back. Can't stay healthy Anybody, anyway. Well, that's a, it's that's a bad, bad combination. <laughs> the point is, who are you going to put in there with no offensive line? But don't line? you see how Elway Excellent. built the defense? Like, we'll see. The irony of John Elway is he hasn't been able to find a quarterback. That's the irony. One of the greatest quarterbacks ever. Got Peyton Manning as a free agent, essentially, and that's the only quarterback he's had. That's really been the bane of their existence in recent years until they had Peyton Manning. But the offensive line, he rebuilt that defense from nothing to speak of to all-time great in two seasons. You think he can't put together an offensive so line? So now he's a faith healer. Now he's going to pull it out of nowhere. Well, he did it with the defense. Um, no, no, faith healer, no. It's not in the face of a lack of evidence. It is faith based in actual rational thought. I, he just did it on the other side of the ball. I want to be clear. Why do you guys think they're in jeopardy? Just because the lack of quarterback? Or? Well, it's a, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's about the quarterback. Uh -huh. It's about the offensive line. And it's about Kubiak. I'm not a believer in Kubiak. Okay. It's not that I don't think he's god awful like he deserves to be fired. They still won eight games thus far. I'm simply saying that he was the beneficiary of what John Elway did. I don't view Kubiak as somebody that stepped in and did anything special. He's moved out of the way. He tried to get John Peyton Manning to see his way at the beginning because he wants to run the football. He's reluctant yeah, to throw it. Uh, obviously, Peyton Manning went against that. He did what he needed to do, and they ultimately ended up winning a Super Bowl in large part because of his game-managing ability along with that defense. But in cool. the end, Kubiak being up in there, to me, is I think it's a factor Let because me, I don't think that he's that guy. Do you mind just because I don't go, like go, agreeing go, go, with go, him go. for this yeah. long? It's almost been sure. two segments, and I got it. Sure. The problem with putting it on Kubiak is you have said he's the beneficiary of what Elway gave him in the past. Sure. But that same logic applies to where he is today. He's the victim of what Elway has not given him today. Okay. The offensive line and the quarterback. Elway chose, as I said, mm -hmm. Brock Osweiler over Cousins and Wilson. He chose right. Lynch over Prescott. He has made bad decisions. And you don't, to Max's uh, disappointment here, you do not build offensive lines overnight. The Cowboys took first round draft picks for three years to create that offensive line. The Raiders took time to build their offensive line. You don't build this thing overnight, and if you're going to uh, take away credit from Kubiak from a year ago, you got to take away from Elway now for the same wait, reason. But if, wait, you, if you have one or on. two guys on the offensive line who can play, you sign a solid guard somewhere and you draft a guy, that can't, it, do, it doesn't usually happen, but it can happen and in every year team would be I want to mention but, something but, quick. But, about the locker room, he, that's he, what we're really did, talking he about. He did here. generate his disagreement towards me. You go ahead. Saying, let me go deal ahead. with go this. Ahead. Let me Please deal with respond. this man. I will wait till you're let done and I'll tell everyone what it's really going on. Because Kubiak, you're telling me that the blame belongs to Elway instead of Kubiak. What was Kubiak in Houston? His last year, he lost like 11 straight. That's why he got fired from the Houston Texans. What I'm saying to you is that I'm looking at his resume. Yes, he went to the playoffs a couple of years. Yes, he had Matt Schaub as his quarterback. But there was things there in Houston that he underachieved that couldn't do. I'm looking at that. I'm looking at a body of work to say that he doesn't get to escape from some of the things that have transpired. When you got the team arguing inside the locker room with one another, butting heads, that has its part and parcel comes with coaching as well. Look, I'll go ahead. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Sure. 
Didn't mean to interrupt your. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just no, saying, no, no, no. Now you come. Your lovers they quarrel. Come, when they come, when they come at me, no, you two <laughs> had the okay, lovers quarrel. Exactly. But go ahead. Um, and this, I don't swear. The peg for survive. this news really <laughs> is the divided locker room, right? I mean, that's what we're really talking about. Look, there's a civil war going on in yeah. Denver. The offense and the defense, and the defense telling the offense, "Just shut up, you guys ain't doing anything," right? That's actually a healthy sign for this team. When you are the defending Super Bowl champions. And the Patriots, your major threat in the AFC to start the season, comes into your house and humiliates you. That team should be angry. They should be having it out with each other. I view that as a good, healthy culture in Denver, not as a reason for Denver fans to get upset. Yeah, I think they're going to be fine as well. Great conversation, fellas. Coming up, Steph Curry trolled his teammate Kevin Durant during last night's Redskins-Panthers game. Curry's team was victorious. Cams wasn't happy with one call in the game. Take a listen. That just can't happen on my part. You know, I just have to let the, the referees, you know, do their job. And uh, I, I thought it was a questionable hit, but yeah, I can't, you know, I, I can't throw the ball at a person. I know that's that's against the rules. Now let's say, give me a second here, Stephen A. Oh, come on, dude. Now we have to watch what's actually happening. Part of this is just hating on famous and good players. Don't have a press conference beforehand because Stephen A. might vote you out. The countdown continues. We're just about two weeks away from First Take's big move to ESPN. So make sure you join us as we go from two to one on January 3rd. We will have some awesome guests in our first week, including Ice Cube, Hall of Famer Jim Kelly, and a live performance by Wale. That is going to be good. You know what else is? We've got another edition of Final Take coming up at the end of the show. I'm extra excited today. No disrespect, of course, to my friend to my right, because it's Max's take. Oh, yes. I'm excited, too. Right. I'm Max, excited, too. Look, damn, man, it's a lot of work. You going to go all in on somebody? We talked about MVP a lot this season, yes. and especially on yesterday's show. And I've heard cases made for Tom Brady and Ezekiel Elliott. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make the actual case for the real MVP at the end of this show. Well, that's what you're going to do. What I'm going to do is sit back here and watch. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see your posture. <laughs> I'm going to watch you look into that camera with the light shining brightly on you. It's just you and the world talking to you. I'm going to see if you're sweating. I'm going to see if you you're want nervous to see how it's done. No, 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 no I'm not, I don't need to see how it's done. I, mean, I, know, I know how it's done. Well, can I, you help him take I, notes? I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm the I founder that created the whole bit. You see what I'm saying? But He's I'm, the founder, I'm, people. I'm, I'm, you are I'm so waiting, extra. I'm, I'm, I'm you waiting to see it. I'm waiting. I'm the founder. I'm the founder. You know, they call me a doctor, right? They call me a doctor. I got my honorary doctor, Dr. Smith. Went to Salem State. Honorary doctor, actually. That's absolutely true. But I'm waiting to see Max. Some in badly misinformed people. I'm waiting about. to see Max in the spotlight. He's got this. I hope you don't get nervous. Let's get the towel ready oh in case he starts sweating. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> just, in case you, just in case you're a little nervous. <laughs> I'm just trying to say. I'm just trying to say. Right. I just you know want to say. I didn't want to last see. night in the Redskins. Can no. we get into that? By the way, I want to wait till Molly does one one of these mm. days. I want to hey. see how Molly's nervous. Molly's yeah. going to be nervous as hell. <laughs> <laughs> are you trying to tell us you were nervous when you were doing this? Not at all. Mm. I'm different. You know, so I'm Stephen that. Oh, you're just... <laughs> All right, let's get That's into so it. That's so arrogant, right? You are. The Panthers, who are last in their division, defeated the Redskins 26-15 on Monday Night Football. Carolina has now beaten Washington five straight times. The defending NFC's champs are now third in the division at 7-6-1. They've fallen from a sixth seed to an eighth seed in the NFC. Their playoff chances fell from 53% to 25%, according to 538.com. Here's Jay Gruden. No, we're disappointed. There's no question. Um, you know, but first off, we we were out coached today. There's no question about that. And then uh, I think they played better than us today. So we got to give credit to the Carolina Panthers. And um, it's my responsibility to get these guys ready to play. Uh, we weren't as ready as I would like to have been. We didn't execute like I would like to have seen. Um, and that falls on my shoulders. But uh, we still have two games left to look forward to and hopefully uh, get a victory against Chicago Saturday. Stephen A., you've been calling for Rex Ryan's head, so... Molly, allow me for a second. Oh, okay, yeah. Because, because I, this was my thought yeah. okay. when I was watching the game. Uh -huh. um, I've been hearing nonstop about Rex Ryan's job out of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two seasons, and he's, you know, kind of middle of the pack kind of coach. 15 and 15, and yeah. 15 and 15. In the NFL, that's, you know, average, solid. You don't mm -hmm. call it that... And I was wondering, with the playoffs on the line and them rolling over the way they did at home on Monday Night Football, not right. ready to play, mm -hmm. after having gotten shellacked in their only playoff game last year under mm -hmm. Jay Gruden, mm -hmm. 
Are you calling for Jay Gruden's job today? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Jay Gruden uh, does not deserve to lose his job. And I'm not saying it just because I love his brother, John Gruden, who's our colleague here at ESPN. Actually, John Gruden's a little bit scared to show up on the set. He likes to get on me via satellite, but he he hasn't manned up and shown up in studio. I think the weather, he can't take it because he loves Tampa being in Bristol a little bit too much for him. But that's a different subject for another day. Here's the deal with Jay Gruden. And you're comparing him to Rex Ryan. I'll tell you why I'm not calling for Jay Gruden's job. Thanks. Well, let me finish with the answer yeah. because he's about to get his feelings hurt. I just like how he set I, up I would, the question. Yeah, you try to set up the question. It's all right. I'll deal with you in a second, Molly Wood. Here's the deal, Max Kellerman. Jay Gruden, where were the Washington Redskins last year? What did they finish? I don't know their record. Nine they, and seven. They, they won the NFC. They won the NFC. When you win the Nine NFC, well, hold it. When you win the NFC East, yeah. right? When you win a division, does that mean that you get to the playoffs? Yes. Uh, so. This is last year, right? Yes. And Jay Gruden was in the playoffs last year, right? What happened when he got hold there? On, hold on. He was there, right? Uh-huh. Kind of. When's the last time Rex Ryan was in the playoffs? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. In any capacity. Division, wild card, whatever the case may be. He hasn't been there since 2010. I keep telling you my hairline was about here at that time. The man can't go to the playoffs. He's not Jeff Fisher. That much you can say about Rex Ryan. Outside of that, he hasn't gotten it done. I mean, listen, I have nothing against Rex Ryan. I'm actually very fond of Rex Ryan. I genuinely like him as a person. I genuinely like to listen to him as press conferences. I like his bravado. I like his belief and his faith in his players. I get all of that. But my God, as I explained with my final take yesterday, if everyone gets to keep their job despite the ineptitude that they put on display on an annual basis, where are the opportunities for those on the come up? This is the National Football League. Every single year, we brag about parity. We brag about teams coming out of nowhere that may not have done something last year, but have done something this year. It might take years to build a Super Bowl contender. It does not take years to to, to, to transform a team into a playoff team. Rex Ryan has been a head coach for six years. Years now without making a play. Six look at consecutive the division. years. Look at the division. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The wait a minute. Patriots wait a minute. There. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. The Steelers have gotten into the playoffs as a wild card. Whether it's Kansas City or somebody else, they've gotten in as a wild so card. Jay the, Gruden. Why, why, are there two His wild record, cards? Just so you know, are, for purposes, uh, 20, 25, and one Are there over not three two years? wild cards every year? Yeah. Yes or no? All right, then. All right, then. You don't have to win your division to get to the playoffs. So, so let me get you don't this, have to beat the Patriots straight. to get to the playoffs? Let me get this straight. Just Come on. For the record, I don't think yes. Jay Gruden should lose his job. Right. Uh, I did think Jeff Fisher should have. Yes. And he deserved and then, you know, that. That and was you, the right you, thing. You did the occasional w- br- w- brilliance of you. I deeply appreciate Mar- it because you agree with me. Marvin Every way to go. Lewis, I have. I, I am on the fence about it. On the fence? Now, now I, will the say, fence? I will say that given the performance where they appeared to quit this year, it may be time to move on from Marvin Lewis. Oh, it may. I it thought may. you jumped the gun on Marvin Lewis, but I jumped, okay. Hold, hold. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm almost, almost catching a heart attack. Did you just say I Wrong jumped sitcom. the gun? Wrong sitcom. I jumped the gun? No, no, no. This is not no friend. No, I know Sam for the son. No, Elizabeth, I'm coming home to join you, honey. I know. Did That's you, not you. Did you just say I jumped the gun? Yes. The man has been the head coach in Cincinnati for 14 years. Yes. 14 and he, years, and man. And he had his team 14, ready to make man, a run last year. The quarterback man, got when hurt. When Marvin Lewis first started in Cincinnati, you didn't even have facial hair. Are you kidding me? This dude has been there for 14 years. Right. 14 years. Not one playoff victory. And I jumped the gun. Yes. I jumped the gun. Yes. How did I jump the gun? Because, because they get to the playoffs. How? Not, only, How? not only did they get to the playoffs, and many teams would have liked a coach like that, but they were ready to make a run. It's not his fault that the right. quarterback gets hurt going into the playoffs last year. But wait, I want to get last I year. Get to what Gruden. about the previous and 12? Ryan, they were in the playoffs oh, consistently. I said playoff victory. Years. I said playoff victory. Jay Max. Gruden didn't have a playoff victory. I understand. But he got you, waxed. Max, this is his third year, oh, 14 okay. years. So, let me, so let's take it back to Rex Ryan. Go ahead. Second. How much equity and how much rope does an AFC championship appearance buy you? Does it give you at least a season or two after that to say this guy is He's not a bum six. coach? He's had six. He had two AFC championship appearances. He's had six years. And I think considering two AFC championship appearances and the fact that he's in the same division as Bill Belichick, it's not like Jay Gruden where he had a bad, or a, 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 a bad Giants defense, a Cowboys team who lost their quarterback pre-Dak Prescott, and, and an Eagles team that wasn't ready. 
So you get to the playoffs with nine wins, but if you're in Bill Belichick's division and you miss the playoffs, yes, a half a dozen years, both to- all yeah. times in the AFC East, and you've been to two AFC championship games, you should lose your job. My point is not that Jay Gruden should lose his job. He shouldn't. My point is neither should Rex Ryan. Rex Ryan not only has not made the playoffs since 2010, okay? Yeah. Obama was in his second year in office. It's not that long. Okay, six years. Yep. He Not only has he not been to the playoffs, he hasn't had a winning record since 2010. And you're coming to me and telling me that a man that hasn't had a winning record in six years, hasn't made the playoffs in six years, is getting a raw deal if he ends up long, out the door? How long what has is he been the in matter Buffalo? with you? How long has he been in Buffalo? Two years. Two years. This is his second year. Okay. And he's 15 Buffalo. and 15. So now. he's a 500 record. Yep. In Buffalo over two seasons, and you want them Max, to act like a dysfunctional no, franchise no, and get rid of no, the coach? No, what I'm saying to you, Max, is a guy who has never coached before, and this is his first go round. I understand the notion that a body of evidence doesn't necessarily exist for you to boot him out the so door. Todd but when, is okay, but the, someone of like course, that he went ten and six okay. last okay. year. Okay. But, 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 he went ten and six last do year. Do when, when Rex started, he goes to two AFC championship games. Then he misses for four seasons. Then he gets a new job and goes, and, goes and 502 again. seasons, and you and, want to get rid of him. And misses That's a new again. job. And misses again. Listen, there is a pattern. Every team, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Is there not a pattern of ineptitude when it comes to Rex Ryan and offenses? Yes or no? Yes, and the offenses, the they could be better. better. He's a de- when you make the a defensive offense, coordinator, the, the head coach, you're expecting a good defensive it's, team. It, excuse me. His defense had 54 sacks before he arrived, 21. It was a 33 point drop. By the way, right. Buffalo, Buffalo's, not an, listen, listen, Buffalo's not, not an easy assignment. Buffalo's not an easy assignment. It's not an easy assignment, but their defense was expected to be better than what it was, than what it is so with Rex Ryan. the defense is expected Guys, to be better and they're a 500 team over you know, two seasons you know, to get rid of the I, I wish we had more time. Molly, here's the bottom line. I'm going to end it with this. Mm-hmm. Your definition Oh, okay. I swear to goodness, I swear I want a boss like you someday. You got I, one. You're I, welcome. I, I'm not. I keep trying to tell you. I, I keep trying to tell you. We all know who the boss is here. The point is, is here's, Molly. The, here's, the, here's, the, Molly, Molly. here's the bottom line. Max Kellerman, you have a license to be mediocre. He's perfectly okay with it. He's perfectly okay with it. I love you, man. I love you. Everybody should love Max Kellerman. I mean, go ahead out there and be mediocre. Be anti-American. Don't be great. By be definition. mediocre, and you're going to be all right by with definition. Max. He'll keep you understand, employed. Understand Unbelievable. This. Every time you have a, game, a team <laughs> one game above 500 in the league, somebody's got to be a game below 500, or it doesn't add up. Somebody. There will be most teams Why in the middle that are by definition Why mediocre. Coach Hey. Guys, I want to get into this play. Go ahead, Molly. You're the owner of the Bills. Well, I got to be the old one on pace. You're so, the owner of the Bills. The story of the game last night, clearly not the story of today, was the no call on Cam Newton. So he took a hit to the head after giving himself up on a slide in the second quarter, but no penalty was called on Redskins linebacker Trent Murphy. Instead, Newton was the one who drew a flag for taunting when he flipped the ball at Murphy after rising from the turf. Here's Cam after the game. That just can't happen on my part. You know, I just have to let the, the referees, you know, do their job. And uh, I, I thought it was a questionable hit, but yeah, I can't, you know, I, I can't throw the ball at a person. I know that's that's against the rules too. So, did the referee do his job? sir, did the referee do his job? next question. In a position like that, um, you know, I, I everyone. I mean, I, obviously, I couldn't run to the sideline. Uh, I was sliding, and. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna be the dead horse, man. So I just can't, I just can't take, I can't retaliate in that way. I'm better than that. I know I am, and, and um, you know, I can't jeopardize that type of play for my team. Serious hat right there. The game referee Walt Coleman said after the game that he saw Cam slide late and the defender went over the top. He did not see any forcible contact with the head. Max, how do you feel about this? First of all, that's a terrible hat. Like, can we just say what it is? It's so bad. It's ugly in any universe, including like Alice in Wonderland. That is terrible. It's important to mention that he felt the need to wear the outfit, possibly the hat with it, because he said that he was paying tribute to Craig Sager. Yes, but, but Craig Sager didn't oh, wear told, those hats. I know, oh, that's what that he told Lisa Salters. That's what he told Lisa Salters. And along these lines, I'm just saying, look, it's important. Cam, Cam, I, I bring this up when Cam it. is the subject apologize, nowadays. Cam. Right. Because, because like A-Rod, mm-hmm. Cam seems so disingenuous at times. He seems so uncomfortable in his own skin, he makes you uncomfortable in yours, watching him. He seems as though everything he says is calculated 
to create an effect in the listener instead of just telling you what he feels. And maybe the NFL is designed in part to dissuade you from saying what you really feel, but he does, there are players who come off as much more genuine than Cam. Okay. That said, and even if he complains about it and the, and the refs don't like him, justice is supposed to be blind. That was helmet to helmet, cut and dried. Should have been, should have been a flag. And then the fact that he gets angry about it, rightfully, and complains, and then he gets called for it, that's messed up. I mean, whether or not he wears ridiculous hats, which he does, whether or not he's disingenuous, which he seems to be to me, whether or not he complains and the refs don't like him, fine, I'm willing to accept that. That's got nothing to do with the way they're supposed to call the game on the field. And it looks to me, maybe it was an honest mistake, but it looks to me like the refs have it out for him. I don't disagree that there seems to be unfavorable treatment coming his way from time to time. They're missed calls. Now, I've spoken to people in the NFL office. They talk about how they analyze these officials every week. But just because the NFL puts forth its due diligence in dissecting, monitoring, and evaluating officials doesn't mean that officials as individuals don't try to implement their own personal biases to influence how a particular athlete is mm -hmm. treated when it comes to penalties and beyond. Having said all of that, it's a couple of things that I'd like to say about Cam Newton here. Number one, Cam Newton bothers me at times. But he bothers me because I believe he's genuinely a good guy. And I think in an effort to try to be so good and thinking about his brand, which extends beyond the football field, he goes about the business of trying to dance around issues so he addresses them without offending anybody. And... There is something to be said about just being real and authentic because it builds and elevates a level of trust. And that is the point that I want, if Cam is watching right now, that is the point that I really, really want him to get from all of this. I want him to understand because I've spoken to Cam on several occasions in the past, as you know, you know what I'm saying? I got a lot of love for the brother. My issue with him is that I think it's incredibly important that you don't be fearful of how you're going to be viewed when you believe in your heart of hearts that you're speaking truth. Because if you're too overly concerned about it, then there's going to come a point in time where you really, really, really need to be heard. I didn't say listen yep. to, I said heard. A lot of people don't understand the difference. Listening to is somebody just giving you their air and allowing you to give them lip service. Being heard is when they literally inhale and comprehend where you are coming from contextually and otherwise. If Cam Newton isn't careful, Cam Newton is going to be the NFL's version of Dwight Howard. Yeah. Remember Dwight yes. Howard? Yes. So Dwight Howard got to Dwight Howard, Howard, point Dwight, out why. Dwight Howard got to a point in his career, and Max can speak to this. Dwight Howard got to Dwight Howard is one of the best people you will find. At times people felt he needed to grow up. But he's a good person. The problem is, is that he cared so much about how people viewed stuff yep. that you got to a point where you couldn't trust but let's talk what he's about saying. The disconnect. And Cam got to be careful about that. Let's talk about the disconnect because that's not the case with Andrew Luck or Dak Prescott. And, and, I, and the difference is to me that you have to drink the Kool-Aid. You have to buy into the way of doing things, to the culture of the game, at, at the quarterback position especially as the face of a franchise. And I don't think Cam Newton believes the NFL or the football orthodoxy, the received wisdom about how you have to be a quarterback. I don't think he believes it. The celebration, stop me then, all that kind of stuff. Andrew Luck and Dak Prescott, for example, and Russell Wilson and others buy in. They believe it. So when they're asked questions, they can answer truthfully because the truth is coming from a place where they accept the way it's supposed to be, according to everyone else. Well, There's no disconnect. Cam doesn't. So he has to constantly watch what he says because he doesn't buy in. But you're thinking about belief. I'll make it simpler for you. They understand the rules of the game and what they came in as they're consistent. So I know what I'm going to get every time I listen to Andrew Luck, every time I listen to Dak Prescott. I see the same person all the time. With Cam, as was the case at times in the past with Dwight Howard of the Atlanta Hawks, formerly the Lakers and the Houston Rockets and Orlando Magic. Those guys, sometimes they sound one way, mm -hmm. other times they sound another way. 
And that diminishes and dissipates the level of trust you have in their words when you feel like they're not being as real and authentic as they could be. I think the bottom line is control what you can control and you can't worry about what other people think. Cam needs to stop. Cam's a good Tim guy Duncan, and a star. Tim Duncan Cam's never had to worry about right. what he said because he knew what he thought, what he thought aligned with what we wanted him to think. And when that's not the case and you try to please people, that's when you have that problem. All right, let's leave it here, guys. A hard left turn. Up next, we are going to discuss the latest in the Brock Turner case. The judge that sentenced him to only six months for sexual assault has been cleared of any misconduct in the case. We'll discuss that next. The California judge who sentenced Stanford student athlete Brock Turner to six months in jail for the sexual assault of an unconscious woman on campus was cleared of misconduct on Monday. According to the California Commission of Judicial Performance, there is no evidence that Judge Aaron Persky displayed bias in his treatment of Brock Turner. Turner was released from jail in September after serving only three months and returned to his native Ohio where he remains on probation for three years and is a registered sex offender for life. I just want to remind everyone, his father, Dan Turner, wrote a letter arguing that his son should receive probation, not jail time, where he said his life will never be the one that he dreamed about and worked so hard to achieve. That is a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of action out of his 20 plus years of life. Will Kane is back with us now. Stephen A., what's your reaction to that? I think this decision is a travesty. Um, I think this judge should have been harshly penalized. I know that he removed himself from criminal cases and went to civil courts. I think that doesn't cut, I think that doesn't cut the mustard. Um, I think that when you consider the fact that this guy in March was convicted, this kid was conv convicted of three felony counts, assault with intent to commit rape of an unconscious person, sexual penetration of an unconscious person, and sexual penetration of an intoxicated person. You had two passerbys that held him down until the authorities came. He was found guilty. The prosecutor had asked for six years imprisonment. This dude gets six months, three months probation. Are you kidding me? And I also think that it highlights the discrepancy in our society because I'm gonna put it out there. I don't know too many black folks that would get off of something like this. Don't get, don't get me started. This is unbelievable to me. I mean, you, you are raping a, well, not rape, sexual assault, because it's the state of California and there's a higher standard for rape, even though legislation has been passed to sort of address that issue. The point is, you have been found guilty of three felony counts of sexual assault, and you essentially spent three months in jail. And then you got the father who talks to the judge, and his last sentence is, that is a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of action out of his 20 plus years. Well, I know people who've been killed inside of two minutes. I know people who've been, I know people who've been assaulted inside of a minute. I know people who have struggled in, in, in less than 20 minutes. And, and, and as a result, you know, somebody's life was taken away from them because they were incarcerated for years and years and years. This kid gets months and the judge somehow they find nothing wrong with this. I think this is egregious. I think everybody should stand up and speak out about it. I think Capitol Hill needs to revisit it. Something needs to happen. Civil case, something. This judge needs to be dealt with. And I don't give a damn what anybody says. I'm going to say it again. If this was a black dude, I don't think this would, we, we, we'd be talking about this. Because this behind would have been in jail. He certainly wouldn't be out in three months. I just want to add one thing to this. And frequently when men discuss this issue of sexual assault on television, you'll hear them say, hey, I have a mother, I have a sister, I have a daughter, and it's like, why should you need that to know what's right and wrong? So I want to preface what I'm going to say by saying that. But I have three daughters, and if this happened to one of my daughters, no. and the father of the guy who did it said what he said... He wouldn't have made it out the courtroom. He and I have a serious problem, a serious and immediate problem. He's going to have a problem with me, uh, and that's the only thing I want to say about this. Yeah, I want to also preface it, um, Max, with this. I think these issues, as they always do when we have sensitive conversations, get reduced into, oh, you must be on the pro-sexual assault camp or you're on the anti-sexual assault camp. Please, please, as though those positions exist. The problem <clears throat> is this, first of all, was the sentence too light? Stephen A., you forwarded an argument suggesting that the sentence was too light. Yes. I don't know. And my position is I would not pass judgment on that. And I'm going to tell you why. Yeah, I need to hear this. But the second position you take which is the more egregious position you take, is that the judge somehow needs to be dealt with and has done something incredibly wrong. This judge, first of all, was a prosecutor in this county okay. specializing in violent sexual predators. His decision in this case followed the probation 
officer's recommendation of what the sentence should be. Third, it was given to a California commission to review to see if there was any kind of bias, including gender bias, racial bias, Stanford bias, any of these kinds of bias in his decision. This commission absolved him. Why would they do that? Because this judge did something. Whether or not I agree with it, we'll come back to that in a moment, whether or not I agree with it, he did something in accordance with the law. If you have a problem with the law, address the law. That's why we have legislatures. That's why we vote on things. But this judge did not do something egregious here. His history and his path to this decision suggest that. He gave you the reasons, by the way, in his decision about why he arrived at this sentence. You can disagree with them, but he gave them. And this is the important point. Justice is by its very nature individualistic. It is about specifics. It is about human beings, specific human beings, specific instances and specific fact sets. Justice, by its very definition, can't be treated as a broad swath by people's race, their gender, these things. You can talk about social justice, you can talk about other things, which are their own concepts, but you have to understand, they are in direct okay. contrast and direct tension with justice. I don't know the, I don't know the facts okay. the way this judge knows okay. them. I wasn't in this courtroom throughout right, the way this okay. judge knows. His opinion here, I defer to on the sentence. With all due respect, what I would say to you, and I don't mean it towards you personally, I get where you're coming from, I respect your position. It's a hell of a lot easier for you to say that as a white person. As a black person, when you talk about justice being individualistic and individual decisions impacting folks, let me tell you as a black man, on behalf of black America, put that damn camera on me, on behalf of black America, there's a whole bunch of decisions made by individuals that have d dramatically, you know, uh, damaged, if not flat out eviscerated communities in our nation. And we all know I'm telling the truth in that regard. That's number one. Number two, when you talk about this committee, demographic Graphically, do you know what the makeup of that committee was? I do was? not. Do you? Exactly. I do not. So my point is this, but I can guess. And, and I'm that not would saying, be irresponsible. No, 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 no. Oh, no, it's not irresponsible. For you to guess? Uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you why it's not irresponsible. Because I have a problem with the decision. So you I'm don't asking, back engineer uh, that. Let me, finish, let me finish. I'm asking. I'm not accusing. I'm saying to you, I suspect. I'm not accusing. Like, I'm not pretending to definitively know. That would be irresponsible. For me to deduce that a guy can be convicted on three felony sexual assault counts that calls for anywhere from six to 10 years in prison, and he gets he three months. He could have got 14 <laughs> maximum. <laughs> a, the prosecution thought that's six right. was appropriate. He, got, he could have gotten 14. The prosecution thought six was appropriate, and instead of six years, he got six months with a lighter sentence that got reduced to six to three months, and then you have a father on the record quoted as saying that is a steep price to pay sexually assaulting somebody and being sentenced to prison. That is a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of actions out of 20 plus years of one's life. Everything you just said, it sounds very pragmatic. Obviously, it's, let me finish. It's obviously well thought of, intellectual, very pragmatic. But when you take the human element into consideration, I'm saying to you, as a father of daughters, this man has daughters. I'm telling you right now, four older sisters, eight nieces. When you talk, I'm not saying I'm not. I know, I'm not I know. I'm not accusing you of being insensitive. I'm saying this ruling, regardless of this prosecutorial background, there is no justification for okay. this in my mind. Excuse me, Max. In my for mind. For one moment. Sure. I completely defer to the emotional response that you have in regards to what you feel towards the other father. You have two daughters, as do you as well. And I would as well, but there, there is a reason. Emotion is supposed to be out of the courtroom. I'm not defending Brock, no, hold on. Sure. I'm not defending Brock Turner. Bro, I'm, I'm not, not defending his I'm father. Not you that. And truthfully, I'm, I'm not, not even defending this sentence. What I'm defending is the concept of justice. Stephen A., when you point out that race has in the past ignored individual circumstances and taken broad things like right. race into the detriment of black people in this country, do yeah. you think I'm gonna disagree with you? Of course not. So I'm arguing to you that Lady Justice wears a blindfold for a reason. And because it's been taken off in the past- But it hasn't no, worn a blindfold. Wear because a blindfold. It hasn't worn a blindfold. Excuse me. Because she's been taken off in the past doesn't mean you take it off again. You don't correct injustice. But that's from not what the I'm saying. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. By making wait, wait, wait. more no, in no. the future. Where I take offense at your words is that you're implying that I'm saying take the blind, you know, put the blinders on again. That's not what I'm saying Those here. Those blinders no, stay no, on. I'm saying, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying to you is this. If there were a question about the man's guilt or innocence, 
I have no issue with the ruling because, okay, somebody may have found an incident. The issue in question here is that the man has been convicted of three felony counts. Who gets three months in prison for three felony Sorry. counts? I want, that doesn't I want, make I want, any I want, sense. A quick break, and we're going to come. We're going to come right back to this. And uh, three felony uh, counts, I three I months. Don't know, I don't. Okay. Okay. We're That's all I'm break. saying. Yep. Max, we'll pick it up right with yep. you. More first take after the break. Stay here. We'll continue the discussion on the Brock Turner case. Welcome back into First Take. We are going to pick up where we left off here. Max, I wanted you to jump in on the Brock Turner case. First, I want to say that the points that you're making will need to be made, particularly when a topic like this, a a, a very um, emotional topic comes up, where where it becomes, as you've mentioned in the past, uh, an outrage competition. And if you are seen as making a point of about the law and you're an attorney you have a legal background it's seen as you're not you're not outraged enough and from conversations with you on and off the air i know that you are completely outraged about sexual assault which shouldn't which i i would hope people would take for granted i appreciate i, I want to say that I about, and i agree with him about the i agree about the issue and justice should be blind about the issue of race Stephen a that you bring up and how it might have an impact on this and why People of color in this country, particularly African Americans, might be suspicious if they see a white person get off with what they feel without looking too much at the details, or maybe even with a lenient sentence. Um, That suspicion is founded in the fact that justice is supposed to be blind, but in fact, judicial outcomes in many, many areas throughout our history and continuing today are greatly affected by race. And so that is a legitimate, I think, concern here. And that is a concern, I think, I don't know if we've discussed it on this show, but that I share. So if the point is that African Americans have in this country been subjected to, for example, greater, more strenuous sentencing than white people have in the past, it's a fact, it's true, it's not absolved, it's not corrected by, then in turn finding a situation with a white defendant and making sure you over punish or get a strenuous punishment. You don't fix it that way. Lady justice has to remain blindfolded, justice has to remain blind. My biggest point is this, don't gloss over specifics, don't gloss over facts. You've said several times, three felony counts of sexual assault. The details are important and the details The details offset it against other cases you could read about and compare it to, perhaps where the defendant was black. But you have to know the details of every individual case to find out if justice was served, because justice is individual. And last point, my biggest pushback is this. It's never served over social media. It's never served via outrage. Justice is only served through focus on specifics and largely done in the courtroom. Can I ask one question, and then Stephen A, you have it the rest of the way, Just, just as a woman. Do you guys feel that serving three months in jail is enough for those acts? Absolutely not. Okay. Feel is the operative word. I'm just wondering. And, and do, you, no. do you feel that? Do you and feel I do that's want to point out. Just, just one more I thing. Want, one other question. Yes, and then, the I, and then I'm no staying out of it because I want to hear. Okay, so we don't feel that's appropriate. My other question I want to ask. Had he not been a, a, from Stanford, had he not been white, do we think he would have gotten the same three months in prison? Uh, probably not, Molly. Yes, okay. probably not. Thank I know you. that that's, African Americans get on average sentences 20% let more me, longer sentences. Let me tell you something. I echo what Max said about you, and just for the purposes of this show, everybody understands this. This is called First Take for a reason. We don't run from a damn thing. We never have. We never will. And when you hear Will Kane come on this show or Max Kellerman come on this show, being here with me every day, and they take positions that they take, maybe diametrically opposed to me from time to time, I invite it. So understand, we may disagree, but at the end of the day, anybody that's coming after you for what you said, they're going to have to come after me too because I wanted you to say what you have to say because that's how we evolve as a society when we're willing to hear where everybody's perspective is coming from and we go from there. Now let me get back to you. You talk about outrage. In this case, social media or beyond or whatever. I think you're smart enough and educated enough to know that outrage particularly on the part of the African-American community, has gotten justice done. Because when people were passe and were not outraged and were tepid and were quiet and were a bit passive, the same old stuff would take place throughout history. History has changed. Metamorphosis has kicked in. Change has arrived because of outrage from pre-civil rights days even to now. That's number one. Number two, let's get specific. 
We talk about this kid here, Brock Turner. And by the way, put his face up on TV. Let's see that guy. He was convicted of three felony counts of sexual assault. Could you put his face up? That's him. That's who he is. Just so everybody knows he is. Don't he get to walk the streets? We're going to put an athlete up in there. Anybody does such wrong. Put the judge up there, too. Put his face up in there. That's the guy that let him off for three months, six months in jail, three months, at, three months instead of six years. Put his face up there, too. Now, last point. Brock Turner. Convicted of three felony counts. OJ got off for murder. What'd they do? <laughs> you know, terrorist threats and kidnapping he's doing 30 years. We all know it's because they missed out on a murder conviction. They piggybacked off of that and got him in November. We're going to get you no matter what, okay? Michael Vick. Well, dog fighting scandal. Peter and everybody else. You made society. Everybody up in arms. Where are they now? You have a white... 20-year-old kid from Stanford who was convicted of three felony counts of sexual assault, stopped by two patrons, held for the police, found guilty. This dude gets just three months in jail. Where are all the I women? Want, I, want to, I, want, I want to react to that. They're there. They're trying to recall this Will, judge. I want to this react, story I want is not to suffering from a lack of outrage. I want to react to that quickly. These, ish, these um, public cases become symbolic, I think, especially to people of color in this country. And the argument that says, wait, we need to weigh the evidence in this case individually, misses the emotion of the use of the case as symbolism, even when there is an injustice carried out by using a specific case as symbolic. And the, the social media outrage, the democratization of media is good in certain ways, and when it becomes uh, a force for a, a bad kind of populism, it becomes dangerous and should be commented upon by the fourth estate, which is what we are here doing. I give you the last word. All I'm going to say is that I didn't mean to imply that the women's groups weren't out there. I'm saying that the noise for others doesn't appear to be as loud for this as it was for others in the past. That's all I meant. My last word is symbols are simple. Emotions run roughshod over individual facts. And it's my job, I feel like when I come here, to address these things directly and specifically. That's what I try to do. Got Not it. defend this guy, and to not even this judge. Of course. Understood. Appreciate the conversation. Glad Understood. we all agree that three months was not enough, and it wouldn't have been the same for other races. Well, thank you so much for you being bet. with us. More First Take after the break. Stay here. The NFL decided not to find Ezekiel Elliott for his TD celebration, jumping into the Salvation Army's red kettle on Sunday night, something Odell Beckham Jr. was not pleased about, saying on Twitter, that's funny, there's no fine for that. I could only imagine if I was the one to do it, just being honest. Max? Yep. Is your guy Odell Beckham? Best receiver in football? Yes, yep. that he is. Is, is he playing the victim card here? Yes, and he's being a little tone deaf here. And Odell, I'm going to address Odell uh, uh, directly. I understand your point about the uneven application of the rules in the NFL, and you feel like you're being victimized, and I've noticed it by the refs and the league at times, or the refs at least at times with you. It's good that Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell supported your point. However, in this case, a brand-conscious NFL is being pro-charity. And to come out now and make this comment makes it about you, which may be good for your brand in the sense that you stay in the news, but I think is a bad look because it, it, it comes off as tone deaf. Well, I think you're right about it being tone deaf, but I can understand where he's coming from because he's trying to bring attention to the unfair treatment. Um, I don't think this was the time to do it. There's no question about it. You're absolutely right. The flip side to it, however, is that, you know, it's funny. Because you believe you're on a collision course with the Cowboys. And you, what you want to do is address the favoritism because you're thinking that it's something that could potentially affect you down the road. And it's something that you want to put to a halt mm -hmm. as expeditiously as possible because it might work to your advantage in the immediate future. I could see 
Odell Beckham Jr. having that kind of foresight, having that kind of vision in this particular situation. I see him a lot of times at the Knicks games. He talks about these things even at a basketball game or whatever the case may be. He might walk around saying, yeah, we know I've got our work cut out for them. He might drop a one-liner here or there or whatever the case may be. You just never know what they're A better look for him, in my opinion, if he wants to make the same point, is something. He could tweet out something like, that's good to know. We can do something that promotes a charity like the Salvation Army. You know, I hope if I do it, like, that's okay too because that seems like he's supporting the idea of helping people instead of making an issue where someone else is bringing attention to helping people about him and the fact that the deck is stacked against him. Well, I think that would have been a better we're, look. We're telling a young man what specifically he should say. Yeah. And that's a difficult thing to do because... A lot on his plate at listen, that age. Listen, as, as, as Lawrence football, as Lawrence Fishburne said, and, and I, I think it was bad, and it was Harlem. It was it was Harlem. It wasn't Harlem Knights. It was Harlem, right? He said, or Hoodlum, rather. He said, when you don't know, you don't know. Mm -hmm. It's a lot for anyone to deal with, especially a 24-year-old kid who's or, or a young man who's... Everywhere he goes, there's yeah. a camera and a microphone in his face. So it's very difficult to come up with the optimal response all the time, but that was a suboptimal yeah. sub response. More importantly, just focus on the touchdowns, right? Uh, speaking of which, it's going to be a touchdown. Max, doing final take today. Your yeah, boy. yeah, yeah. I can't yeah, yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to miss what he has to say. Let me sit back and watch. Let's when see. Max gets fired up, let me tell you, folks. First break I've ever had on first take. I get oh, to just sit bye. back and chill. Always about and watch. you. Okay, of course. Victim. What about me? That's going to be the name of my production <laughs> company. First Take is brought to you by Advil. Fast, powerful, and proven relief that makes pain a distant memory. You are so disrespectful. He is going to fall off a cliff. Shut the hell up. That's not even close to my best. They're wrong. And I don't give a damn that they agree with me or not. It's time for today's final take. Max Kellerman, the floor is yours. With one play, one single snap of the football this past Sunday, Aaron Rodgers reminded us why he's the LeBron James of the NFL. The best and most valuable player in the game every time he steps on the field. So here it is, the Packers and the Bears tied as time wound down at Soldier Field on Sunday. Green Bay had the ball third down and 11 at their own 26, going into an Arctic wind. Hurry up, Aaron Rodgers. The clock is your enemy, Aaron Rodgers. Need at least 45 yards, Aaron Rodgers, to give your kicker a chance. Why are you walking up to the line? How can you be mismanaging the clock like this? But Aaron Rodgers saw that Jordy Nelson had single coverage in Bears rookie Cravon LeBlanc, that the safety was squared up to Devontae Adams and would not cover the deep middle. So Aaron Rodgers ran some clock, 40, 39, 38. If third and 11 didn't work, the Packers have no time to win in regulation. But third and 11 was going to work with plenty of time to spike the ball, get Mason Crosby on, and kick the winning field goal. Rodgers knew it because, as he's been telling us all along, we need to relax. He had the brains to see it, the guts to call it, and the arm to throw it. He's carried a team to the brink of the playoffs with no running backs, diminished wide receivers, and what, the worst secondary in the NFL? Put Aaron Rodgers on any other team in football and ask, is that team better with him or with the guy they already have? The answer across the board is every team in football is better with Aaron Rodgers as their quarterback. Look, Kevin Durant and then Steph Curry won the last three N NBA MVPs, and I suppose their regular season numbers say that they deserve to, but we all know LeBron James is the best player on the planet and the actual MVP every season. Football ain't basketball, I know. No one player can dominate in the NFL in quite the same way. But as long as Aaron Rodgers is doing Aaron Rodgers things, he's the guy you want, the best player in the game. And when he takes the Green Bay Packers to the playoffs this season, your NFL MVP. Fire, Max Keller. Yes, sir. I'll take story time yes, sir. with Max any yes, sir. day of the week. Well you have read. From hello. So Lucid, good. very articulate. Oh, thank you. Thank I'm you sorry. Much. It was brilliant. It thank was special. You. That was Way great. to go, Max. We'll we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.